uh, I was very interested in the whole idea of agentic agentic experiences. Um, are there any current ones that you already use in life on a day to day basis that you've either hacked together or created, or what are ones that you think are the most exciting in the near term? Oh yeah, now I'm gonna come back up. Oh. Uh, Let's figure this one out. Cool. Okay, so on uh, agent uh, kind of agent experiences, um, uh, I don't think I have any that would qualify as agentic in my life right now. Um, uh, partly because these things are just so new, and I actually think most of the use cases will be on the enterprise side. So they're gonna be like things that we never even see that are just happening behind the scenes in our technology and in our software kind of every day. Um, uh, there's, I'd say, I, I don't know how this exactly happened, but some something like six months ago, there must have been a memo that like everybody read uh, w that sort of set off this, this kind of agent kind of startup wave. Um, because in the past month or two, I've sort of increasingly seen new startups that all have a, a, a somewhat similar pattern um, that is basically defined by um, or defined as as um, you know traditionally when we you know when any of us sell software we kind of say hey like you know your your employee X you know does a particular business process and here's software to let them like go and do X and like we're going to enable them to do that thing better and all these new agent so startups are kind of saying hey you uh, have a task that, that somebody does or, or, or you, maybe you never got around to, so it's not even like you don't even have anybody doing it. We have software that will do that task for you. Um, QA a website, um, do outbound sales, uh, you know, generate a, a, a marketing you know, tr translation. Um, and, uh, and this pattern is emerging uh, pretty rapidly from, from what I can tell where I've seen, I don't know, maybe a dozen or two dozen startups like this, but it feels it feels kind of akin to um, uh, honestly, like like the early 2010s almost, where where like we finally figured out like what mobile was going to look like. Like there was like a few years of pretty shoddy kind of you know kind of approaches to the mobile wave, like 07, 08, 09. You're kind of like that's kind of like janky and like the there was a web app probably and it didn't work really well and then all of a sudden you're, we're it was just like boom instagram boom uber boom instacart boom, boom doordash and we we're just like oh actually so your phone is this sort of new command center for for just like things and then and then like everybody got the memo and then we we were off to the races and and lots of startups didn't work but like we at least all kind of knew more or less how this was going to work I think we're now emerging in the space in AI where we're kind of getting that memo, which is like, no, it's not going to be like 150 different chat applications. Maybe maybe there'll be a couple that, that, that kind of make it, but it's actually using AI as more of a brain behind the scenes for really kind of just taking work that you would have done otherwise and automating that. And um, and that's that's pretty exciting. I think the uh, I think the one thing that that is really interesting about it is um, is that uh, it does really put a lot of pressure on how you architect, you know, whatever it is you're building. Um, so I have a, I have a friend working on a, a on a startup, and we'll we'll like you know go through, you know the 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 what 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 he's what he's building, and at any given day, you know the the updates to a GPT four or a Gemini are just like basically in, you know solving entire you know kind of components of what you would have had to go and sort of mask or make up for if you were building like a GPT three point five paradigm. So like pretty wild that just from three five to four you do a lot less sort of you know you know kind of constraining the system and, and preventing it from doing things because now you can take advantage of of more of that AI model and so and so it's almost like actually like shit like maybe should you be building a startup only just anticipating GPT five and don't even worry about GPT four like it kind of almost begs the question of like don't launch anything right now wait till this thing is even more intelligent but of course you know at some point like you could do that um, uh, uh, you know if, if you extrapolate that out too much you just wouldn't launch anything so it's like hard to know exactly the moment um, uh, to uh, to launch but uh, but but it is it does really mean that you need to future proof your architecture in a world of agents. Okay, so, all right, I'm gonna go there and then I'll come here. Uh, this mic is working, so we're in cool. good shape. Will you, will you stay here with me? Sure, okay. there you are. <laughs> Hi, hello, uh, my name is Ilya, actually ex-Endeavor staff and current co-founder of Morphosis. 
So I wanted to ask, uh, we mentioned at the beginning, like... Did you say what your name is, Ilya? Ilya. Ilya? Yes. Like the most famous name in AI? <laughs> okay, wow. Okay. Well, this okay. is she. <laughs> okay, yes, different, but, uh, but yeah, okay. So actually, in this current AI and, of course, like future AI world we're living in, do we need humans or... What do humans need? The well, we role? have to build the AI. Least, <laughs> so yeah, of course. But yeah, yeah. Uh, what does what skills do humans need uh, in this current involving AI world? It's yeah, uh, I mean, a great question. Like the question, obviously, for for all of us. Um, uh, par I think my answer will be be pretty unsatisfying um, because I think honestly we don't know the answer yet. Um, sorry, let me let me actually specify. Yes, we need humans. Uh, what we should go do about that? I don't know yet. I don't think anybody really knows because, again, the pace of, of, of sort of AI uh, development is, is, is happening so quickly. Um, uh, but I am, I am not convinced yet, and I've, I've you know, spent hours debating everybody I can on this, I'm not convinced that, that AI doesn't look fairly similar to prior kind of uh, technological revolutions. It, it feels like it's different this time because it feels like, well, the, the intellectual thing is now like, we're, it's coming after intellectual stuff. And um, uh, but I'm not convinced that that it actually like at a at a in a grand scheme at a at a sort of macro level looks any different uh, in the sense that that uh, what what I expect to happen is our the tasks that we do every single day will just begin to look very different um, and it, it'll look like a little bit different at first and then it'll and then a little bit different you know thereafter and then you zoom out and then ten years from now it'll look totally different. So it almost won't even necessarily, like we won't even feel it probably because it'll just be these incremental changes that amount to a, a large amount of change. But if you, if you like, you know, if I showed what I do on a computer screen to my, you know, um, uh, to, you know, previously my grandparents, they would be like, what are, what, how are you creating value in the world? Like you're just on a computer screen and you're just sending an email to like back and forth and then you're like in, a, in this Slack thing, just chatting, and it's like that, that creates value in the universe? Like it would just be confusing, right? Because like they'd be like, well, why are you not like in a, in a room and like, and you know, with, with a chalkboard and talking about a thing and building a, you know, like, like so just, so imagine in 20 years from now, the version of that, which is like, like the, the you know, person doing work, it just says, hey, I need you to, you know, quickly analyze this market and all the trends on it and come back with a, a, an answer about this thing. And like five seconds later, it comes back with that thing. Like that would obviously have compressed, you know, let's say 20 hours of what a human would have done. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden we're gonna not work those 20 hours. It just means that we have the answer to, to then move to the next step in whatever that particular process is just 20 hours, you know, sort of sooner. And I think if you just kind of multiply that out against kind of all of our work, I, I'm not convinced it, it, it then sort of meaningfully changes the job equation. Um, now, of course, like this is one of these things which is like, it'd be like really bad to look really wrong on this. So maybe this podcast will be like the, the, uh, the end of me in like 10 years. Um, when we, like, <laughs> this really is not our goal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, like I thought the tweet re reading was the problem, but uh, it was actually predicting that jobs are fine. Um, uh, and we're like totally fucked. But, uh, uh, but I, I think that in any area where we can bring automation, for the most part, doesn't mean the job won't change or shift a little bit, but for the most part, you generally just get either more jobs or a shift of what the labor was doing as a result of that automation. Um, and my thought experiment is, um, uh, is, and again, the whole system is sort of experiencing this. Maybe there's some sort of un unforeseen factors, but, but again, I'm still, still pretty convinced of it. My, my general thought experiment is, um, is like a very kind of simple one. If I could get an engineer within Box to you know, write 20% more code, and let's just imagine it's all perfect you know, code, or a sales rep to be 20% more productive, i.e. for the same dollars, they can sell 20% more in, in revenue. In both of those examples, the benefit I'm gonna, the, 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 the uh, improvement gains that we see, I'm going to reinvest those gains back into the business to grow even faster. In neither of those cases, am I as CEO or my co-founder as CFO, or are we gonna take those dollars and just be like happy with higher profit levels. Because firstly, because we're gonna be competing with somebody who will use that productivity gain to compete even better. So it's not like we're, any of us are in a static market. So, so we will just have to go and reinvest whatever that performance improvement is back into the business, which would mean more sales reps because if, they're, if right now you're paying them X and they can generate you know, X times three, and now they can generate X times 3.5, 
Like I want as many of them as I can humanly get, probably up to the point, frankly, where it goes back down to three. Um, uh, and, uh, and just because there's sort of a natural rate that you expect kind of a sales you know, person to be productive at. So I think that's gonna happen for most jobs. Again, there'll be nuances. So if, if today you're doing like very frontline customer support where the customer emails and they say, hey, I need to reset my password and the AI now does that, what does that mean? My, my hunch still is, is that actually you'll just move to a higher level set of tasks that the customer is asking for, but maybe some of those jobs have to shift into more customer success as opposed to customer support. So, and anybody who does B2B software, we can't get enough people to spend time with our customers. Like, it's just like, there's, there's a cost equation. Like, I would like to have more people that can go spend time with our customers. Instead, we have to spend a certain amount of time and, and dollars on just pure inbound, like, I have to change my password type emails. So I would take those dollars and reinvest them into things like customer success. It would actually be the same person. Like there's like it's this, like the skill is comp- is relatively transferable. It would just be a different set of work that they'd be doing as a result of what we freed up. Again, there will be examples that are exceptions, but in in, in you know every other era of automation, this is more or less what we get. Um, and uh, and I'm not convinced this is that different of uh, of a component of automation. Aaron, can I ask, like, what are we working toward? Like, we're building this God level of technology that can do almost all of our work. And in 20 years, we're still going to be working. Yeah. So why are we going to do that? Well, well, so it's funny. So, I mean, uh, you should have invited, you know, maybe Sam Altman up here because um, he, his, He's welcome his, to come. An, his answer will, yeah. what's that? He's welcome. Okay, good. Yeah. So I think his answer would just be different than mine. Um, I, I think he would say we get closer to a higher level of species where we're not, you know, having to like analyze the the market trends, like like the computers are just doing all of that, um, and uh, and and you know he is uh, uh, you know he is much more futuristic on this dimension. I'm not sort of sure I understand why we wouldn't just sort of ultimately consume all of the work the AI is doing as people, and then just still want to do more than what the AI did. Um, but you know, it's very possible that there's some crazy step function change that I'm not imagining that you know Ilya saw, saw uh, the other Ilya, and and is like and is like you know at that moment you know then then everything really kind of you know changes completely. But you know this was five or ten years ago. I mean, people like Vinod, I think Sam to some extent, you know, had a view that maybe we end up having UBI in the in the future because AI is doing a lot of these tasks and. And then we will just sort of share the benefit of that productivity back to society and humanity. And um, I don't even necessarily know if, if that would be a bad outcome. I just don't necessarily think that's the one that will happen. I think like people will just find a way to, to have other people work that they want to work with to go and produce things and to innovate and find the next kind of set of problems we want to solve. Cool. All right. We have one here. My name is Adam Anzoni. I'm the CTO of FunWall.com. Um, you guys know nice. each other. Oh, yeah. We do, yeah, we do. Uh, uh, great, uh, great user of, uh, of the platform. Yeah, good to see you in New York. Good to see you. Um, yeah, we've um, definitely at FunWall.com, we've seen um, the value of doing things like programmatically extracting information from things like bank statements. And obviously you think a lot about content and it sounds like you're thinking a lot about, you know, GPT-5 and even if you watch the GPT-40 demo, you saw like basically computers now have eyes essentially that we don't have to train. Like in the past, vision models had to have training done to do what we you know saw in that demo. Yep. When you think GPT-5 and all the content that Box stores and and has, um, I mean, one thing I'm really excited about is video. Yep. But are there other um, use cases that you see unlocked on the content layer um, with these newer, higher performance models? Yeah, so um, I think, uh, again, if you go back to the earlier framework of, let's just say, you know, cost, quality, uh, performance, and context window, and if you, and at GPT-5 for me is just like a, like, just a, a kind of a, a shorthand for, like, way better AI. Um, so maybe it needs to be GPT-6 for the, the thing I'm talking about, but but when you have those factors all improve, so AI is you know, 10 times cheaper, 10 times faster, 10 times larger context window, 10, to, 10 times better in, in intelligence. Um, the thing that we think about, uh, you know, given the business that we're in, is what do people do with, with their content today? And, and what if you had effectively AI agents do many of those things you know, on our behalf? 
and and thus I can again throw compute at the problem as opposed to people at the problem. So um, that that is you know some of the most straightforward things like just I want to review every contract in my business and understand like all of the risk in in my business against all the contracts I have or every contract that is up for renewal. Um, uh, you know, in, in, in your business, that that's a version of just you know things like okay, every single loan you know that, that is coming in, I want to review everything about it and be able to you know quickly have some assessment of that information to make a better decision. Right now, you know, we're limited by just all the things you know, all the aforementioned things, which is like like how much data can I put in the in the window? How kind of intelligent is the model itself? What is the cost for doing that? Um, and if those go away then we can basically deploy AI agents to do a lot of the, the kind of, you know, frankly, very manual, not very strategic, not very differentiating work that, that either we all spend our time on or, or our colleagues spend time on um, and, um, and, and at a scale that was just never possible before. You know, um, I can deploy a thousand legal review agents at a problem instead of the one person in the legal team that can spend time on this. That's just a totally different way to solve business problems um, inside of an organization, so you kind of just you know put that across everything, and this is this is why this is also why I'm just like extremely optimistic is is um, uh, you know uh, uh, as we as we heard earlier, like if you're in SF or in, you're in New York, let's say, like the the access you have to like the best law firm or the best you know marketing agency, you know this is fantastic level of of access and, and networking that we have, but whether it's a startup somewhere else in the world or they maybe didn't get as much funding or they're not in the in this sort of flow of, of what's going on you know AI as an example this is you know three to five years out um, for, for this idea but like if AI can basically do the things uh, you know that, that are usually those first steps to just getting started with the business that that I didn't have access to before because maybe I'm like a three person startup in some you know name your country, like now I can actually have an outbound sales team. Uh, now I can actually like actually scale my engineering more effectively. Um, I, I think this is a massive boon for, for any small business, any startup, any team that wants to experiment. And I don't think it's gonna take you know, from jobs because those startups previously just like, they actually were not hiring those people. They were just sort of stuck in whatever they were currently doing at a certain scale that they were at. So, um, so I think this is gonna be, I, I think, you know, an incredible asset for anybody getting started or, or scaling up. All right, I definitely want to give people more time to hang out and mingle, and we'll still we'll have more pizza and beer in the kitchen in a moment. <laughs> um, I also want to say that 15 years ago, I started coming to tech meetups in New York City. I was early in my career, and we got a chance to hear from some of the luminaries, people who were really pushing the cutting edge forward in the technology world. And we saw people from those tech meetups end up advancing to places within the big tech companies and in media and one of them became a really noxious internet troll, but most of, all, most of them ended up being, being great and, and productive members of, of our society. And I think that there is a real value in bringing people together. It's so cool to see so many people here, many subscribers of big technology, and some people that we're meeting for the first time. And this is gonna be a tradition that we're gonna start here in New York and, and around the world, and hopefully we'll come to San Francisco soon. So thank you all for coming out. Woo, let's hear it thank for you. you. And that being said, I, I think it's just been such a great privilege, Aaron, to be able to speak with you. I feel like every time we scare, we uh, schedule the podcast, some crazy stuff happens in AI. Now, yeah, maybe that's just because things are happening every week, but it feels like we always end up with the peak. We, we have been well timed in uh, in these, but um, but I also I really I mean this is. We started Box in 2005, and I have never uh, seen anything like this. Um, the amount of, of just sleepless nights on, I, you just have to catch up to like three different company keynotes in one day. And it's just like, it, it's insane, the amount of innovation that's happening. I think, you know, 95% uh, of it is good. 5% of it is like very stressful and like, oh my God, like you never feel like you're moving fast enough and you're not catching up to the right thing. Um, but most of it is just like, wow, what a lucky time to uh, to be witnessing all of the, the technology change. Absolutely. And so, thank you for helping well, us unpack it and yeah. understand it. So thank you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next time on Big Technology Podcast. Thanks, Great. Aaron. Yeah, thank you.